So the um, work that I'll be talking about today is part of my ongoing um, dissertation. And so it's um, basically press rightward facing triangle, semiotics, and cross-cultural metaphor in phone applications. Okay, um, this is a pilot study, um, but I think the results of the pilot study are still linguistically very interesting and um, will be fairly different from the results of the full study, um, just by the nature of the changes that I'll be making for the full study. Um, but what I wanted to look at here was to test the methodology um, by which we can see delays in perception and the errors that people make um, when, we're, um, when we're asking individuals to interact with symbols on smartphones. Um, and sorry, I'm trying to move the video so that I can actually see my slides. Um, so the symbols that I'll be kind of referencing and talking about are the basic system icons um, for the majority of them, but um, there will also be a number of symbols that I am creating for um, my uh, kind of ongoing work. So, you know, basic phone system icons as shown here. Um, this is part of the larger research program, which um, um, includes the development of a, a phone application called WeTalk um, that is intended to be a language agnostic documentation app. So there are a couple of different functions where um, it guides uh, the users through collecting text. So like uh, guides them through taking a nature walk and giving a narrative about what they see along the walk or taking pictures of plants or animals that they see and talking about those um, things in the actual target language. Um, a number of dialogues, stories, word lists, um, things like that. Um, and by language agnostic, I mean that there is no written language anywhere in the app itself. So every task, every um, instruction for the user is conveyed through images. Um, and so making sure that the images themselves and the meanings behind them are very, very clear is uh, integral to the actual, you know, the app actually functioning and doing what it's intended to do. Um, and the idea behind not using language is um, I don't want the people who use the app to be obliged to operate in non-native frames um, or to use a colonial or um, otherwise like majority language when they're trying to document a language that you know, may have been put in, uh, in an endangerment situation due to the colonial or contact majority language. Um, and so we want people to be able to operate and to work on documentation, revitalization work without having to engage with that. Um, so one of the ways that we're also trying to supplement this is by using culturally situated storyboards. So um, the frog story is great and super cute, but um, not especially helpful in situations where um, people don't keep frogs as pets, little kids don't catch them and put them in jars, things like that. Um, and then it's also just kind of important to note that the intended audience for the app is not necessarily, um, they've not necessarily used phones. They could be, you know, the last speakers of a language. So they're um, quite elderly. They, they might not actually be literate in their target, target language. So just translating instructions isn't necessarily the solution. Um, and so, yes. Um, so you know, just an example of the culturally mediated storyboards here is um, we've been working on these in Cameroon. Um, and um, in order to not have language and to get across uh, more complex meanings than you can typically in storyboards, um, developed a, a set of uh, speech bubbles that use images and uh, you know, kind of short series of um, images and symbols to get across what the speakers are trying to say. Um, and then the phone UI uh, and how does it actually play into all this? So this is the medium through which the user will access the app's functionalities. Um, and there's already a fairly large literature about adjusting phone UIs, this is the user interface, to be closer to the expected cultural and linguistic norms. So the biggest example here is um, when you code an app, making sure that you're um, trying to include um, an elements of bidirectionality, so basically mirroring the app so that um, you can more effectively match a right to left or left to right reading direction for users um, and what they expect to see. Okay, 
Um, so the larger research questions for the study in general um, is if it's possible at all, how can we ensure that non-linguistic symbols are sufficiently salient to users from a really wide variety of cultural backgrounds? Um, how might we alter signs to increase their rates of recognition? And how many alterations can we be made to signs that were understood before they cease to be? Um, but before we can get to those questions, we have to actually look at how can we know which signs are easily understood? So that's what the pilot study um, wanted to try and answer. Um, for this study, um, I'm incorporating a fairly uh, diverse background. Um, so it's the theory of signs and icons and pictography. Um, the, I'll do a brief overview of some of the literature. Um, there's a lot. Um, and then also a look at studies of cross-cultural consumer perception. Um, so luckily, these are all questions that are very important to people who want to make money off apps and that sort of thing. And so there's been um, a, a very large volume of work looking into that. Um, then my pilot study, the results, and the continuing work. Um, so semiotics is uh, the study of signs in general. Um, and in this case, it's relevant um, because we want to be able to kind of break down the actual symbols that are in phones and that people will be interacting with and to analyze the individual components of it to figure out what parts can be changed or not changed and what people might be attuning to when they're looking at any individual symbol. Um, more directly kind of applying semiotics uh, to phone um, or in general to UI developments, um, Break of 2015 um, looked at how a user interface can define a human computer interaction. So that's the HCI there. Um, and how it's um, all a metaphor. So um, we can look at the ways that the various features of a uh, user interface can be analyzed as a sort of grammar. So we can look at it the way we would a natural language. So um, we have what are called discrete elements. So these are lexemes, or sorry, these are the shapes, colors, and sh shadows of the given symbol um, or that are present on any web page or app or whatever uh, computer uh, interface you happen to be looking at, um, which we could call the lexemes. Um, then you can take a step up. When you combine those individual elements um, into a symbol, you can think of that as a morpheme. You can combine um, an action plus a symbol. So this is clicking on a symbol or dragging something across the page or anything like that. To, um, you can think of that as the lexical item. And then you can look at the path of commands. So if you have to accomplish a certain task and there's first you click, then you drag, then you drop, then you uh, rotate something, all of that would be the phrase um, of the actual utterance. Um, and we can also kind of make another comparison to natural language and having a relatively small number of discrete elements that can make a very, very large number of phrases. Um, and the phrases that are proposed by these discrete elements and by the UI need to match the user's mental model. Otherwise, there will be a disruption in the um, natural flow of interaction between the human and the um, computer. So um, there was an experiment as part of this study that looked at um, Chinese and Czech individuals to determine um, whether or not their expectations of what they were going to be looking at um, caused any kind of um, errors in what they should be clicking on or delays in response or anything along those lines. Um, in this case, it was web pages, not apps. Um, and they basically manipulated the color of the web page, just the general palette, but also the combinations, um, the orientation of the text, um, and then what the location of the main information. So having the most important information right in the center of the page, to the left or to the right, things like that. Um, and the kind of biggest and most relevant to, to my needs um, result here is that when um, faced with a series of images for the um, Chinese individuals, the next the expectation of where the next image would be was about 50% on the right hand side of the page. Um, versus uh, for Czech people, the um, right side of the page was at 80%, um, with a much lower uh, percentage 
for the other three and then um, the 25 and 20 for Chinese people with left and bottom. So there's a, a much um, more salient tie to the right side of the page for um, the non-Chinese speakers in this study. Um, then we move over into pictography. So this is the uh, study of the use of the stylized images to convey linguistic meanings. Um, we know that there's a shared set of really iconographic symbols that we can see repeated um, globally. So spirals and circles having association with sun or light or life, triangles being landscape features or women, uh, wavy lines for water, things along those lines. Um, and that a lot of the symbols that we see in advertising or more commercial elements grew out of these um, and originally came from ancient Roman trademarks in many cases. Um, and then we all, uh, from these uh, has been developed a set of communicative design pictograms, CDP, I'm sorry, there's so many abbreviations, um, that um, are this set of stylized images that have gone through um, just so much focus testing and everything to get the perfect, you know, the angles here and all that, um, that to be used in UIs. Um, and these work through a, ser a set of shared generalizations and stereotypes. So people know that, oh, this really stereotypical um, stylized image of a camera means camera. I can take a picture if I click that one. Um, and so the, the shared ideas about what um, each individual pictogram would mean here. Um, and then finally, I'm not going to go through all this just because I don't want to go over on time, um, but we have a number of studies that look at um, gesture um, and whether or not um, gesture and images in general can be divorced from their iconic meanings over time. Um, and we see that they, they do follow the same patterns that we see in spoken language of moving from iconic to symbolic um, as time goes on. Um, and then finally, the consumer and user perception. So this is kind of where, if you've done all the rest of the work, you've gotten the sign developed, all that, um, you then need to test it with individuals to make sure that there isn't some um, cultural association with the symbol um, to, that might be negative or might uh, impact whatever you're trying to convey or sell or um, otherwise communicate to people. Um, so we, we know that some globally used symbols um, have very different meanings in different countries among different cultures. So in this case, um, the two kind of target cultures were uh, Danish people and Spaniards. Um, and so we had an image of a walking person and an image of a heart. Um, the walking person uh, for um, the Danes elicited, um, people were basically you know, given the image and asked, what feeling does this give you? What do you think of when you see this? Um, and they had kind of the general summation of sun, summer, vitality, you know, that sort of vibe. Um, for the Spaniards, it was happy, healthy, or mourning. Um, and note that the sun was not a rising sun. It was just in general, a sun. Um, and then for a heart, it was a very kind of medicalized meaning for the Danish people. So a hospital, medical doctor. Um, and then for the Spaniards, it was health or well-being. Um, and this was a heart that had the little EKG line over the front of it. Um, and so if you're trying to, you know, get people to, so in particular, in my case, I want to have a symbol that tells people, oh, this is the nature walk function. I need to take my phone and go for a walk. Um, if I have a walking person um, and it doesn't convey the kind of outdoor nature meaning um, in some way, it instead conveys, you know, sun, summer vitality, that sort of thing, then the meaning has not come across and that could lead to confusion, um, especially for, again, um, the older users of the app who might not have actually used a smartphone before. Um, so my actual study, um, I wanted to kind of target and test the methodology to make sure it actually was going to work for the much longer survey. Um, and the question here is that, is there a difference in the response times between stimuli that were just unexpected and ones that conflicted with the accepted cultural metaphor? Uh, so I had three question types, uh, which image, which task or action, and which is preferred, and I'll show examples of those. Um, for this, I tested just a single sign, so the play triangle, um, so it's the you know, little triangle that faces to the right, um, and then changed uh, the orientation and positioning on the page in order to test um, people's response to it. 
Um, and then I just used Scitoolkit so I could get the response times. So um, the question types here, and these were all presented on um, just a, a mock-up of a basic smartphone um, in order to not prejudice people to expect, oh, well, it looks like a Samsung phone. My phone operates that way and get those kinds of issues. Um, so the question of which task or action is that they were given a set of possible actions, um, the tasks that the app could do. Um, and they were asked to say which action they thought a given icon would cause. Um, so in this case, uh, this is one of the options with the triangle. Um, they could take a picture, scroll through a series of images in order, move to the menu, move to the main menu, or move to the next activity, um, or none of the above. Um, then for preference, so it was just a straight which of these arrows do you prefer? Um, and this was basically a control to make sure that the respondents um, were, or sorry, that the participants were responding to the orientations as expected. <coughs> um, and this is basically just, we don't tend to see um, arrows in, or the, the triangle facing upward or downward um, as often as we see it facing to the left and right. And when it's only a single arrow, we see it facing to the right the vast majority of the time. So making sure that people kind of said, oh, well, that's the most familiar. Um, and so the question for this one was, which best represents the command? Move to the next image. Um, and then a set of three questions that were all, uh, which image do you prefer? So you want to move to the next image in the gallery. Which of the red arrows would you, above should you choose to click? Should you click to do so? Um, and there was a horizontal version, a vertical version, which is shown and then a horizontal versus vertical. And on the horizontal versus vertical, the red arrow was uh, pointed down or to the right. So I had 32 respondents. Uh, five were removed for not completing the survey. Um, there were 25 female, three non-binary, and five who chose not to answer. This was an open-ended question, so they could fill in whatever they wanted. Um, and then the reason the numbers don't quite add up there is that one participant indicated both female and non-binary. Um, the websites where I distributed the survey do skew very heavily female and queer, so the represent so I will you know, seek a much wider sample uh, for the final survey to make sure that it's representative. Um, the average age here was 27, um, and they were all American with no reported experience in languages other than American English, which was also um, a control. I did not want um, any have, uh, experience living in other cultures or communities as much as possible. Um, so the preference has the clearest results and it is very encouraging because it's exactly what expect I expected. Um, so there's this overwhelming preference towards uh, the, for the orientation being to the right when asked uh, which of these triangles would move you to the next image. Um, this fits with the idea that the kind of future is to the right that you would get out of um, both the reading order and um, the way that calendars are arranged for people. So just kind of the way that um, in a written or, or visual media people interact with the future would be to the right. Um, then the which task question had the kind of least clear results. Um, and I do think that for the actual you know, non-pilot study, um, instead of having a uh, not, um, you know, the task isn't here, not available. Um, answer, I'll have a free response for this one just to see what people, you know, what else people think that it might be indicating. Um, and though the results here aren't especially, you know, there's not the runaway, oh look, it's basically everyone. Um, there is a really kind of interesting um, groupings that we can see. So when the arrow is pointed up, people uh, responded more with the main menu or just not listed. They didn't know what it might be indicating. Um, and this kind of fits with the idea that, you know, an arrow pointed up, you know, kind of this hierarchical structure of you enter an app at the top and you move down through the various functions. And so the main menu is kind of conceptualized as being at the top of the structure. So it fits with that idea. Um, then we have for the arrow that's pointed down, scrolling the gallery is a common um, answer. This again makes sense with the way that many people are going to be interacting with um, image galleries on smartphones. So you scroll, you know, the air, you move down in like uh, Twitter or Insta Instagram when you're looking through 
the various pictures. And so it's a, a behavior that people are used to. Um, for the triangle point to the left, we have main menu um, and then uh, also not listed as the two most common. Again, this is kind of the main menu being what you did previously, you entered on that. So there might be an association with the past there. Um, and then for the one point to the right, you can see it has kind of the strongest result there towards next activity or scrolling through the gallery. Um, again, though, these are all, uh, the only one of these that would be considered significant is the arrow point to the right. The rest of them were too varied to say anything in particular beyond my own speculation. Um, and so I think adding, kind of taking the not listed out as a possibility for the main question and then having a follow-up question, which asks what other tasks might you expect um, will help clarify this uh, set of questions in particular. Um, and then finally, the which image. So again, this was the horizontal, given the choice of left or right, which would you pick? Right was chosen here. Um, the vertical versus horizontal, given the choice of horizontal right or vertical up, which would you pick? Horizontal right was chosen. Um, and then for vertical, given the choice of up or down, which would you pick? Down was chosen. So this is next image in the gallery. Um, interestingly, the one person on both vertical versus horizontal and vertical only uh, who chose not the expected one um, was not the same person. So it's two different people who have uh, different ideas about which image should be chosen there. Um, and then the response time was um, most salient for the which task, since this is the place where the triangle is presented in ways that would be against what you expect. Um, so the first question that they were presented with, um, or the first, the question that I have num labeled number one here, um, is the most expected. Um, and uh, actually, sorry, no, um, there's a wrote that wrong on the slide. Um, questions one and three are the least expected, two and four were the most expected. Um, and you can see that in particular comparing one with two and four has a statistically significant difference in the amount of time it took people to respond. Um, on two, there are more outliers than normal. These two people must have just gotten up to take a short break, go on a walkabout uh, or something, just given how long that response is for those. Um, but those uh, obviously are outliers. Uh, so again, this um, matches with what I had hoped to see for the response times, that if something goes against the expected um, task that you might be accomplishing or the expected orientation of a symbol um, paired with the task, you're going to get a much longer response time as people kind of have to think through what they're seeing uh, versus being able to just kind of go quickly because it's the, the usual and the expected. Um, and then finally, so the continuing work is the much larger survey. So this is the full set of icons, um, including the ones that I've designed um, that indicate new tasks. Um, before they enter the final survey, I have them actually currently out um, to a number of people to kind of um, test just the actual sign, make sure it looks okay. All of that, uh, that part of the development stage. Um, and then I want to translate the survey into modern standard Arabic and Mandarin Chinese, um, just those two are chosen in particular because I have access to speakers um, who are willing to translate for me um, and distributed to participants who are monolingual native speakers of Arabic and uh, Mandarin um, in order to um, get at the, so different, uh, test the orientation, all that with people who have a naturally different reading order and um, expectations in that domain and make sure that the way that the symbols are incorporated into the app doesn't uh, inhibit um, understanding for people from cultures where it's not you know, the, the same, the uh, left to right reading order and things like that. Um, and then once that part's done, to incorporate the results into the UI development of WeTalk to ensure that the app is the most useful possible thing that it could be for uh, people trying to document their languages. Thank you. Thank you very much, Megan, for this very interesting talk. Uh, so I noticed you are looking for uh, bilingual standard Arabic and Mandarin Chinese uh, speakers. Oh, no, not bilingual in those. Uh, separate uh, monolingual a tricky yes. combination but in, yeah. in china you have this minority 
of Uyghur people who use the Arabic alphabet, so maybe they uh, probably all speak, uh, all write also uh, Chinese, so maybe they could uh, work out for this. Mm. Any question from the audience? Amalia? Yes. Um, oh, it seems to me that you ha you are in danger of uh, not getting enough truly cross cultural, cross culturally interpretable symbols. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for example, with this this arrow, you know, we we could probably expect that right to left scripts. Pe speakers of languages that use right to left scripts would interpret it differently. And you gave us examples of, of um, culturally determined uh, interpretation of some other signs. But what do you do if and when you find out that you can't get enough signs yes. that people actually agree on? That so the hope is that so the, the area I'm the most concerned about um, is actually less the um, kind of very symbolic, so the, the um, arrows and that sort of thing, um, just because in you know kind of the worst case scenario, I can put um, a button that is a drawing of someone speaking um, in order to say, now record, now speak, that sort of thing. So I don't have to kind of rely on the, um, so the kind of classic record button that's the circle within the circle. Um, because that's very tied to, um, you know, this, oh, it's a VCR or it's a camcorder. Like that's where that button was originally used and that sort of thing. Um, so if I run into the issue of those sorts of symbols not being understood by enough people, um, then what I can do is kind of move to a much more um, iconic. So this is a person who's speaking, that sort of thing. However, for that, what I need to test then is how understandable are the kind of conventions of speech bubbles and conveying this person is now speaking and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, so it was, kind of brings up a whole separate set of issues there. Right, and I was um, struck by some of the examples you showed at the beginning of your talk where um, there were pictures to indicate what the people were doing, but I was struck that there were, uh, yeah, here there's check marks exclamation marks and question marks yes which are very uh, written yes uh, um so i, I thought w uh, wanted to ask if you uh had any comments on that like the use of of these mm -hmm. punctuation things we're not using a script but we are using punctuation and, and yes uh, what what were you thinking about that so in pr for these storyboards in particular were um, developed in um, partnership with one of my colleagues who is working on documenting IASA, which is a Cameroonian language. Um, and the speakers of IASA are not, um, they're not necessarily literate in IASA or um, have ever seen it written down. Some have, but not the entire community. Um, but they do have extensive experience in written English and French. And so they're very experienced with punctuation because it would be the same in, in all three contexts. Um, and uh, Yasa, when it is written, uses um, the same letters, I actually believe, as French because most of the people are Francophone that he works with um, as their second language. Um, but so in this case in particular, we could be confident in using the punctuation as a way to supplement the images. Um, if there's a context where we can't use the punctuation, can't be sure that those will be understood. Um, the or that current... the punctuation goes in the same direction. Yes, or that's, yeah, it can be in the same position on there. Um, we do have for these, in other contexts, we have the images flipped. So um, for it, we have where he's uh, seeking the cow, the, the question mark is coming before the cow um, to indicate that part at least. Um, the current idea and the drafts that I have out to people to see if they're understandable is changing the color of the speech bubbles. So learning what colors have negative or like angry associations in the culture and changing the speech bubbles color to indicate tone in that way rather than exclamation points or the X's to indicate anger or negativity. 
Um, the other option is using uh, smaller versions of facial expressions to try and indicate the tone of voice in the speech bubble. Um, but yeah, so that, that is definitely an open area of trying to convey intonation in what we want the characters to be saying. Um, but the other hope is that given that they're storyboards, um, any use of them would be um, kind of in part of a conversation either between multiple speakers of the language and therefore you're getting really great naturalistic data that way as they figure out what is meant to be said in each kind of panel um, or with the linguist first um, walking through it in whatever language is being spoken as part of the documentation project. And so, um, yeah, the hope is that things that aren't necessarily super clear in that case would actually elicit more data as people talk about what they might be wanting to say or discuss. Very interesting. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Megan.